we have seen that art and science have, uh, are different languages with a common vocabulary. And as a matter of fact, my research could be a painting. This painting here. Food shapes who we are. The author of this painting, Giuseppe Arcivoldo, seemed to know that we are what we eat. And he was right. Almost. We are what we eat and what we metabolize. There is a conversation between the food we eat and our biology. On one side, food shapes our biology, but on the other side, our biology shapes the unique way we respond to food. And today, we will look behind the scenes of this conversation between food and our biology. This is a very personal conversation. Sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes it's loud. And sometimes there's no conversation. Food and biology stop talking with each other and we can get sick. Let's take as an example our conversation with a slide of bread. A slide of bread sends the same message to all of us. Calories, 94, protein, 4 grams, carbohydrates, 17.7 grams, fat, 0 0.8 grams, fiber, 1 gram. But each of us responds with a very different spike in blood sugar. Some people are low spikers. They have a low blood sugar response, a kind of quiet conversation with bread. Some other people have a moderate or a high or very high response to uh, uh, blood sugar to bread like a conversation spoken with a, a slightly raised voice, a loud or even a shouting voice. This voice depends on our unique biology. So if we want to understand our unique response to food, we have to understand, we have to ask, what makes us biologically unique? Never we felt so close to answer this question as in the year 2000 when the first draft of the human genome was released. The human genome, the entire sequence of our DNA, had the promise to reveal what makes us unique and different from other animals. Scientists were literally betting on how many genes will turn up when the human genome was finally sequenced, mapped. And do you know how many genes we have? Biologists cannot answer this question. Just, just a guess, how many genes do we have? Five hundred? Yeah, this was actually very close to what scientists uh, at that time were thinking. And the reasoning is that uh, they expected us to have lots of genes to explain that we are such a complex and magnificent creatures. But uh, the human genome produced some shocking surprises. <laughs> the first shocking surprise is that we humans have actually more or less the same number of genes, uh, 23,000, uh, as simple animals like mice, fruit flies, and worms, and 50 times fewer than an onion. <laughs> the second shocking surprise is that genes account for only 2% of our 
our DNA. And if that weren't enough to hurt our genetic egos, <laughs> then there is a third shocking surprise. And we can illustrate that with a, a quick uh, experiment here. So please turn to the person sitting next to you and look at this person carefully. I know it uh, feels awkward, but you are doing this in the name of science. <laughs> so don't worry about it. So um, now, uh, be prepared for a shocking surprise. Um, Guinea-wise, you are actually 99.9 .9 similar to the person sitting next to you. So technically speaking, our DNA can explain 0.1% of what makes us uh, unique. Um, and this is, uh, can uh, perhaps give us an idea of why, uh, despite many companies are trying to predict our traits, our response to food, um, with the personal genetic testing, these predictions are not very accurate in most cases. Here an example from my 2020 report, uh, according to which uh, I am 72% likely to have straight hair. <laughs> uh, so all these shocking surprises, anyway, bring also good news. We cannot change our genes. And if genes explain such a tiny percent of what makes us unique, then we have a voice in determining our identity and health. The language of this voice is epigenetics. Do you remember the cover of the Time magazine from 2008? The new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. So, what is epigenetics? The prefix epi comes from the Greek language and, be, and means on the top. So, if the DNA is our genome, then on the top of that, there is a second genome, the <coughs> genome, made of molecular switches that, that can turn genes on and off just like a dimmer switch modulates lights up and down in the room. And these are without changing the underlying DNA sequence. Epigenetics is what explains why we have so many different cells in our body. We have seen the different cell types in the retina, and then neurons, fat cells, all cells with different shapes and function, but all sharing the same DNA. How is this possible? Think, think of the genome as a hardware, and then the epigenome is a software that tells which genes to turn on and off in each cell to ensure cell identity and function. And there are two important properties of the epigenome that allow us to become software engineers and affect gene expression by making life, lifestyle choices. And these properties are, let's start with the first, epigenetic flexibility. So unlike genetic sequence, Epigenetic switches are flexible, are dynamically modulated by our lifestyle. Factors such as diet, pollutants, stress, chemicals, additives can send signals to enzymes that write, erase, read epigenetic marks on our DNA, thus modulating gene expression. And diet is the most potent signal to our epigenome. That's why food is not only calories, but is also information. And by making the right food choices, 
we can also induce positive changes in gene expression. Queen bees are masters at making good food choices. They develop in royal jelly. Royal jelly is a protein-rich substance that is produced but not eaten by worker bees. So queen bees grow large and fertile and, uh, 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 and they can live 20 times longer than worker bees. But now the most surprising thing is that actually queen bees and worker bees are, are genetically identical. The hardware is the same, the software is different, and diet plays a big role. So if environmental factors like, such as diet can write epigenetic marks on our genes, then you can think of the epigenome as a set of sticky notes placed on your genes. Despite being flexible, epigenetic modifications are also stable enough to survive subdivision. And this delicate balance between flexibility and stability allows our epigenome to store a molecular memory of our life exposures. And usually, the notes taken before our birth tend to be permanent, as if written with a pen, whereas the notes taken after our birth tend to be reversible, as if written with a, a pencil. <coughs> Both pen, pen and pencil notes can affect our health and predisposition to disease. The reason why the notes written before our birth tend to be permanent is because our epigenome is almost naked during embryonic development at the first stages, and so very vulnerable to environmental signal. So when, this, when the egg and sperm fuse together, <coughs> they erase almost all epigenetic marks giving rise to embryonic cell cells. This can become any kind of cells because they don't have the software that programs to express a determined set of genes in each cell. So they can become any type of cell. And only when they do establish epigenetic marks, they start to differentiate in the many kind of cells that make up our body. And as I mentioned, this uh, time window is very sensitive to environmental factors, especially diet of the mother. And food can affect so both pen and pencil marks, so after our birth, and in turn, the pen and pencil marks can affect our response to food going back to the concept of this conversation. And let's give some example of pen and pencil marks that, have, that are affected by the environment, that by the food we eat, and in turn affect our food response. The first example comes from a historic tragedy, the Dutch hunger, hunger winter during uh, World War II. Uh, during World War II, uh, there was a, a, an embargo uh, in Holland uh, imposed, imposed by the uh, uh, Germans. And as a consequence of that, more than 20,000 people died. It's not surprising that uh, the babies born during the famine were underweight and had many health uh, issues. But what is surprising is that when these baby, babies uh, became adult, they were more prone to become obese. 
And even more surprising is that even the children of the famine babies were born underweight and more prone to become obese, even if they were never exposed to the famine. Scientists went and measured the epigenetic marks of the famine babies and the same sex siblings that were not exposed to the famine and found out significant differences in the, in the epigenetic marks, uh, especially in so-called thrifty genes, genes that make us more effective at storing calories. And having these uh, genes turned on is a good thing in uh, moments of uh, famine, a bad thing in uh, moment periods of feast. So this might explain why the family babies and their children were more predisposed to become obese later in life. They were carrying these permanent marks written in pen that persisted even five decades after the family. And now let's look at an example of a fancy mark that um, is affected by food and in turn uh, modifies our response to food. Beer is an excellent example of that. If we drink um, uh, a beer or two, uh, we induce some pencil marks in our liver cells that turn on genes that are required to break down alcohol. And so we can uh, the next time we can uh, we drink a beer or two, we can deal with it better. It's a training effect, isn't it? But this uh, um, this happened when we drink the beer a few days later, but not one year later, because these pen these marks are written in pencil and are reversible. Uh, so this shows us that in the conversation, in our conversation with food. Really, food shapes oh, sorry, our biology, our epigenome, and then in turn, the epigenome affects the way we respond to food. But if this is true, then can we perhaps use epigenetic biomarkers to predict how we respond to food? This is what we are trying to find out in the diet study um, uh, by Professor Christopher Gardner. This is the largest study ever undertaken to compare low carb and <coughs> low fat diets with 609 healthy men and women that are randomized to either a low carb or a, a low fat diet that they follow for one year. And uh, uh, rather than establishing which diet is the best for everyone, um, I am looking at uh, epigenetic marks of uh, people that lose a lot of weight, the high responders to each diet, and people that don't lose weight or even gain weight, the low responders, and trying to find if there are some uh, epigenetic signature at baseline before these people start the diet that can help us distinguish who is going to lose weight on a diet or who is going not to lose weight on that diet. Um, and the advantage of doing that is that one day we might be able to combine <coughs> genetic biomarkers and epigenetic biomarkers to increase their predictive potential. While genetic biomarkers tell us about <coughs> the starting line in our health journey, the bad, the good and bad predispositions we were born with, the epigenetic biomarkers can tell us where we are now as a result of our life history and exposures. For example, coming back to the beginning, we know that people that um, consume a, a, a higher amount of uh, refined carbohydrates for a longer time, they carry distinct epigenetic biomarkers compared with other people and are more likely 
to have a shouting conversation with a piece of bread. So I hope that um, I convince you that we are unique in two ways because of our genes, the book we are born with, and because of our epigenome, the book we are author of. And diet is the best pencil you have in your hands. So thank you very much. For your